pleased uh, to welcome back Ed Bastian to speak here at the Wings Club Foundation. Ed, as I said, is the CEO of Delta Airlines. With this extensive network, Delta and the Delta Connection carriers offer service to 323 destinations in over 59 countries across six continents. Ed is an 18-year Delta veteran, probably feels like longer than that. He was a central part of the team that led the airline from bankruptcy to its current position as one of the industry's leading airlines. In May of 2016, Ed was named CEO. He previously served in several leadership roles at Delta, including President and Chief Financial Officer. Ed is also a board member of Virgin Atlantic and a trustee for the Robert W. Woodruff Art Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ed Bastian. So for today's interview, we're very pleased to welcome Scott Merowitz. Scott is the editor of the digital platform Storytelling at the Associated Press. He spent the last six years covering the airline industry for the Associated Press. Prior to arriving at the Associated Press, Scott covered travel and business at ABC News. Welcome, Scott, and please join us up to stage. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Ed. Um, so earlier this month, you marked the one-year anniversary as CEO of Delta. Uh, you've been there a long time. You were part of that team that brought the airline back to being consistently profitable. So now as we enter the next phase, what are your plans and what do you see, where do you see Delta heading? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the Wings Club for the invitation to come on your 75th uh, anniversary. It's quite an honor and a tribute. I know we have a lot of Delta fans and loyalists and partners out in the audience today, thank you all for showing. It's a, it's a great turnout. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great year, uh, the first year. We had, uh, we had a few hiccups along the way, but at the same time, the Delta employees delivered the best operational performance of our history, the best uh, customer satisfaction and performance, and the best financial results as a result of that in our history. So with that as, a, as the first year behind us, I think we were off to a good start. But our goal is to continue to drive that level of, of excellence and that improvement. There's many, many things that we're working on to do that. You know, it's the airport experience, what we're doing here in New York at LaGuardia. It's what we're doing out in L.A. We just moved terminals. It's, we're launching two new fleet types with the 350. Thank you, Barry. Uh, coming this fall, and then the C-Series, Elaine's here somewhere, uh, which we're la launching in the spring. See you in the back. He's hiding back there um, out, of, out of harm's way, I guess. Um, He's hiding from the Boeing guys, I guess, but uh, or they're hiding from you. I don't know which one, but the uh, hopefully on other sides of the room. Um, but we got that going on. We've got a we got a huge technology uh, investment, not just in the resiliency of our technology, but our digital platform and innovation. So it's a really exciting time to be here. Great. Let's talk a little bit about segmentation. Um, we've seen United and American go ahead and let's say copy your basic economy uh, fare structure. Now I know you can't talk about fares and where we're heading with that, but you've got on the A380 when it arrives some new suites coming out and you've seen the basic economy concept expanded from market to market. So where do we head in the future with segmentation and what does the consumer need to know from you? You know, you've done a great job on Delta.com of making people very aware of what they're booking, but a lot of people who are going through those third party sites still don't necessarily know what they're getting. Sure. Well, we, we've had basic economy in the market for about three years and it's, it's done well for us. We, we're not going down the path that American and United have taken with respect to truly decontenting uh, the experience for the customers. We don't, uh, we don't believe in that. But what we have is a part of our business, there's a commodity component. It's you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of our customers that really price is the most important determinant that they make with respect to the travel decision. And we want to be able to compete uh, with, with commodity providers. And, that's, and that was our attempt to do that. But the other side of it is that consumers today increasingly also want choice. And by bringing whether it's our Comfort Plus product, our premium select that you're going to be coming in up to Delta One, we're introducing choice to a market that hasn't had it in the past. It was more of a one size fits all. Uh, and so it's, it's a new concept. Merchandising in the industry in the past has been we've been pushing fees on people. We'd rather pull back from that and let, let people choose what they want to buy and have it, have, have, make sure the value matches up to the price point. And how does that help you drive more revenue? Where are you seeing people make that sort of click-through decision 
um, and saying, yeah, I'll pay an extra $30 to get a seat assignment. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a considerable percentage of people that do that, that, that click on and say, yes, that, that's what I want, or I want my, the, the, the higher frequent flyer miles, or I want to be able to choose my seat in an aisle. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an increasingly important, it's not as, as big an offensive strategy. To me, it's more of a defensive strategy to try to keep the commodity component from infiltrating your full price structure on your airplane. Um, switching gears a little bit to the international market, Delta has been showing a great growth in that area. You have Chad, spoken many times about the threat of some of these other airlines that are starting up with lower costs. I'm curious what, you're, what you see as the biggest threat out there. Is it Middle Eastern Airlines? Is it a low cost transatlantic carrier? And what outside of government regulation can you actually do to combat that? Well, the international market is a, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it always is interesting, right? You've got, you've got a lot of things going on. Uh, for us, we've, we've taken an approach to be much more active in terms of investment. So we just closed last month on the acquisition of a 49% stake in Aero Mexico, so we're now the single largest uh, stakeholder. I see our COO from uh, Delta, Mr. Mike Medeiros, in the back of the room. I saw him this morning. Mike, good to, good to be there. Mike is a perfect yeah. example. He's Delta born and raised. We just moved into Mexico City, and he's the chief operating officer of Vero Mexico. We announced this morning the guy that runs our Asian Pacific practice, Vinay Dubey, was just named CEO of Jet Airways in India, uh, which we, we, we worked together with Naresh to do. So, so it's more than just going in and, and investing. It's actually starting to move the physical talent and the world. Because I look at the world for the next 10, 20, 30 years. International, while it's not a popular place to be today, will be a place that needs to grow if we're going to grow uh, our franchise. The U.S. is fairly mature as, a, uh, as an industry. So we're, we're out there making these investments, and we're working with Korean Air. Hopefully, we'll be announcing something with them, uh, with them soon. On the question of the Norwegians and the ultra-low, we, we, we compete with low-cost guys all day long, and we're, we're happy uh, <laughs> to compete as long as everyone's playing by the same set of rules. You know, that's, that's the important uh, uh, attribute there. And the Middle East carriers, we, we've got a very different view on that. You know, we, we see the size of the subsidies, we see the, uh, uh, the uh, which we believe is the largest abuse of a fair trade, free trade agreement that there sits out there with $50 billion of subsidies that are being offered. So from our standpoint, if we're not successful in, in getting the government to examine this and to take action, the U.S. carriers are not going to have an international franchise that they could have long term. So mm -hmm. we're going we're to be around. We're going we're to be there fighting. But we also need the government to make sure that there's a level playing field. Open skies does not mean open at any expense. And you know our jobs are not for sale. And we're going we're to support our people. And if you don't get that government support? Do you compete service? Do you target markets more selectively? How, how does that philosophy change? Well, I'm not going to speculate that, because I think we are going to get the support. Good answer. <laughs> uh, those outside of the industry, everybody's been talking about customer service these days. You know, each day, there are about 2.5 million passengers flying in this country. There are bound to be some customer service issues. But the cell phone has changed that, where even the slightest hiccup can suddenly become a viral headache for an airline. How do you change your operating procedures moving forward, both on the social media front, responding to these instances, and also in training your staff um, to go above and beyond to make sure you don't get in that situation? Well, you know, the thing about our business is our people are on stage all the time, you know, with cell phones or without cell phones. They're in front of 200 people or they're in the airports and they're used to being very visible. And uh, what well, we teach our people the values of the company and that's what we hire for, the values is that, you know, about courtesy, about compassion, about honesty and about integrity and treating people the way you'd want your family members to be treated. And if you take that approach towards, towards the environment, you're going to be on the right side of that. We've got your back. Uh, the social uh, media explosion with everyone walking around being an amateur photographer or videographer or whatever it is, I, you know, it, it, that's here. It's, it's, it's penetrated you know, multiple layers of society, and we'll, uh, we'll learn to deal with it. We're still playing catch up on the social media component of that because for us it's been very much a more deep playing defense rather than playing offense, and 
we'll, uh, we'll learn as we go, but I'm, I'm proud of our team, and I, I don't lose any sleep about the decisions our people make every single day in very difficult situations on board our airplanes. We, we carry 180 million people a year. So we carry a cross-section of society, and we have a full cross-section out there, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. Noticed on my flight last week. Um, ha have you changed the way vouchers are given out for compensation? Has there been an increase there? You're talking about uh, on denied, denied boarding? boarding. Yeah. Um, we did announce an increase for the authorized limits to where, uh, where consumers could be, uh, could be uh, involuntarily denied, but that, that hasn't had much of an impact. Uh, we only had, I think in 2016, 1,200 people that were involuntarily denied. So that was about one in 100,000. And what about the voluntarily denied? You know, I, long before any of this went out there on viral videos, I was coming off a flight in Denver and I heard the Delta Gate agent offering like $1,200 um, on New Year's Day for someone to volunteer. Have you need to up those? It, it's, it's all market-based and it's, it's, it's a decision that the gate agent has the tools to do. You know, one of the things that we did that's, that I think some of the airlines will start copying here soon, I, I don't know why they don't actually, <laughs> is that we do a private auction at the kiosk. So when you check in for your flight, if we're oversold, and by the way, oversales usually are not because of an oversale. It's because we've had an equipment change or there's been a cancellation, there's been some other reason why the aircraft needs to, uh, needs to reaccom people. Uh, we ask people for what their price is. You know, if you're willing to volunteer, tell us what, what price you're willing to volunteer for. So our agents at the gate have a list of what the, you know, and start from the bottom, you know, who's the, who's the, who's the first person that, because you, know, you, you never want to do a public auction, right? Because yeah. that's, everybody's, you know, <laughs> be quiet, don't, don't, you know, don't bid. But you want to do it, make it a private auction. So we know what the true, the true market clearing price is. And that's why we've had the success. We've had, I think, 10, probably 10% the number of involves that many of the other majors have had as a result of that. I'm clearly bidding too high. I never get picked from the kiosk. Yeah. <laughs> But the other thing we've used, I mean, we, we give people iPads. Okay, you know, how much does an iPad cost? You know, $500, $700? It's a lot cheaper than, you know, $1,000 of, of other stuff, right? And so, but people feel like they got an iPad, they, they take that rather than take a travel voucher. And yep. So we're, we're, we've been very creative, and the, the importance is putting the um, responsibility and the tools of the hands of the people at the first point of contact. We're at the gate to make things happen. And it's, it's actually, people, people generally walk away pretty happy from the experience. Uh, speaking of iPads, let's talk a little bit about electronics. Uh, right now there's a laptop ban from some of the Middle Eastern countries back to the US. There was talk of such a ban between the US and Europe that seems to have quieted down, but is still lingering out there. If such a ban were to come in place, what can you do as an airline to help entertain or capture the business travelers? I know a few airlines have been giving out tablets to passengers. What, what do you think you would do if you got in that situation? Well, first of all, we don't know what's going to happen. And I, uh, I'm not, again, I'm not going to speculate on yes. what, the, uh, what the Secretary of Homeland Security is going to decide. He's, you know, it's been a uh, rather public debate uh, with the EU and the, and the US security uh, teams. And, but if indeed a ban does, does, uh, is implemented, we'll certainly abide by it, we'll, we'll comply by it. We, uh, we do have uh, our game book, uh, game plan ready. I'm not going to disclose it here uh, to what we're going to do, but we're ready in the event of. And this is a resilient industry. Uh, people travel. I've seen estimates of up to 10% of the, of, the, of the international travelers. I, I don't understand how people know what that number is. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that not having your laptop on, on, the, on board your plane is going to keep people going from going to Europe this summer or anything. So there's going to be an inconvenience factor to the business traveler, which we'll work hard to accommodate. But we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to work around it if it goes into effect, and we'll figure out ways to, uh, to adapt. We're, we're an incredibly nimble. Uh, industry, if you haven't noticed. I wouldn't be a good journalist if I didn't ask a follow-up there. So without giving away your game plan, what's the general philosophy there? Is it to keep people productive on planes through yes. whatever means? Yes, it is. Okay. Give people what they want. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and on the other question on that, there's been a lot of talk about the safety of putting a laptop in the cargo hold. You know, we had an incident overnight with a JetBlue flight where a laptop apparently seemed to catch on fire and they diverted to, I believe, Grand Rapids. 
is there a concern about safety in the cargo hold and also just you know more broken or damaged electronics? We we have uh, you know we've had incidents on board our planes as well over time with you know you get sometimes you get an electronics you might get an iPad or a portable device that gets stuck in the gears of a seat and it starts to burn and we've we've had incidents on board already. So I think that the issue with the cargo hold is one of the factors why a decision hasn't been made to ban uh, electronics from the cabins yet. I think the, I think the security teams are, are still working through what that means on the safety, the safety element. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about politics. Uh, let's see, American just hired a new head of government affairs. You and United have yet to fill those vacancies, but have been actively looking. What, what is the state of regulation right now under the new administration, and what goals do you hope to accomplish for Delta? Well, I think the stated goals of the administration line up very well with our with our uh, our strategies. I mean, first of all, this administration ran on a platform that they were going to protect American jobs and enforce uh, U.S. trade treaties. Uh, open skies and the Middle Eastern issue is, is is top of my list in terms of making certain that happens. Uh, ATC reform, a tremendous uh, portion of the infrastructure fund is going to be focused on modernization of air traffic control. You know, contrary to a lot of popular opinion, we are endorsing and supportive of modernizing air traffic control. It's just the question of privatization, the how, not the what. And, but, but we're at the table and we're having those conversations. Uh, taxes and regulatory reform. Uh, again, this president is, is committed to, uh, to bringing down taxes. There's not a more heavily taxed industry on the planet than the U.S. airline industry. 20% off the top goes to pay for infrastructure and other taxes, some of which, by the way, go off property. It's not, it's not exclusive just to helping run the, uh, the airline in infrastructure. So I think there's a, there's a lot in there that the, that the administration is working on, and we're going we're gonna to be uh, right alongside them in, in trying to make certain our points, points of view are, are well represented. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit about customer experience. You've brought back meals and coach on a lot of mm -hmm. routes, particularly the transatlantic, uh, transcontinental ones. This fall, you plan to debut suites in Delta One on the A350. Can you talk a little bit about how um, the experience is going to change in the next year or two for passengers? Well, the the, uh, the number one driver of a lot of our decision making as a company is how do we improve our net promoter scores? And it's, that's what I'm compensated on. It's one of the most important determinants for my, my bonus and my, my compensation as well as all the uh, 80,000 people of Delta Airlines. We are at all time record highs with respect to our domestic net promoter scores and international still has a way to go. And with the success we've had on our operational performance stats which lead the industry, we realize it's more than just showing up you know, safe on time, you know, with your bags. We want to make certain that people are enjoying the experience to the extent we can. So we went back as far as just even our, our, our snacks, free snacks in coach, the little uh, peanuts and uh, pretzels that we give out. You know, we got down to, I think, about three pretzels a bag, and people were, people were chewing on cellophane, and it wasn't healthy. So we, we said we had to find a better approach. And, you know, we asked, or uh, asked them, well, how much do the free snacks cost? And they're not so free. We spend $13 million a year on free snacks. I said, well, that's not so free. And they said, yeah, we can't afford to do, do branded snacks. And I said, well, if you do the math and we have 180 million customers that we pay $13 million for, that means the average person gets about four cents. Mm -hmm. I think our customers deserve more than four cents a customer. Right? I think maybe we could spend a dime <laughs> or maybe even a quarter and lose our head. <laughs> you know, and, 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 what, and what we've seen is we've done that. And now we're actually bringing the, uh, the branded companies in, and they're competing for the right to be on board. And they're actually funding a considerable amount of the snacks, so we're going to have a better experience for customers as well as a better, a better outcome on our, our financials, and we see our net promoter scores continue to grow. I mean, so that's just a small illustration. And then the next thing was food. You know, it's, 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 it's hard to sit on a five- to six-hour transcon flight with no food. Mm -hmm. Right, and so we said we got we got to figure something out. And of course, as soon as we went back in the market and we added it, we saw our scores, you know, jump jump through the ceiling. And we said we've got to keep doing more of it. And as long as we see those scores moving in the right direction, and we know the revenue will follow, we're going to continue to continue to push push that forward. So, with the branded snacks, have you gone down under that four cents uh, per passenger cost, or you're still no, we're, in between? No, we're, we're we're above the four cents, but it's 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 not nearly the cost you'd think it was. Okay. 
Well, my two-year-old daughter is a big fan of the new pretzels. The new pretzels? She, she has been oh, grabbing good. them from flight attendants all year long. Good, good. Um, and sorry, look, and the premium cabin. Can you talk a little bit about the suites and how is that going to change air travel in those competitive international markets? Well, they, they are incredibly competitive. And you, you talk about the Middle Eastern carriers and the luxury product that they, that they display. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fiercely competitive market. Uh, we've been doing well. Our team's continuing to take, take share in that, in that space. But we have to continue to invest in the experience. So keeping, whether it's the, it's the, it's the product itself in terms of the food, whether it's the serviceware, we've just introduced the new Alessi line, which has gotten great, great success, whether it's the, it's, we won the, uh, won the award for the, uh, the, new, uh, the new seat that's going to go on the 350 with the, with the enclosed cabin in Delta One, uh, which is the first time a U.S. airline has won the seat of the year award in over 10 years. Uh, big deal. So, you know, the, you know, when people talk about the airline industry and you get, you get a lot of the consumer uh, rhetoric on social media with respect to the videos, I understand that. Mm -hmm. This industry has never been safer, has never been more reliable, has never invested more heavily in the experience for customers, and we're going to continue on that path. This year at Delta, we'll invest close to $4 billion in, in, the, in the company, in the product of, of the airline, and we're going to continue to invest at that rate because we realize that's, that's where the real returns are in this, in this industry. It's so only competing for customers, not competing solely on price. And the customer is willing to pay more for that Delta experience? They absolutely are. And you, you see that in our net promoters, and you see that in our revenue premium, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to open up in a second to questions from the audience, but um, first I want to get one more question about frequent flyer miles and the relationship with American Express. This is one of the most profitable parts of any airline I've seen out there is the credit card deals. And American Express has had a bit of a struggle with losing Costco, losing JetBlue. The Starwood Marriott merger now puts that deal in flux. You could be left as the last big marquee brand with Amex. Does that give you more leverage? I, I don't think it gives us more leverage. I think we've got plenty of leverage because uh, we are their largest co-brand already by a, by a decent margin. They, they are they're, they're a premium, uh, premium brand. Uh, they are, you know, people think about the the Amex card as a bit of, a, of an older demographic, a higher, you know, I, I, I heard the other day that of the millennial generation, it is the t most preferred card in the marketplace for the millennials, okay? It's an aspirational brand. It's a, it's a high quality service brand. And linking the, the Amex brand alongside the Delta brand and having, being the exclusive airline mm -hmm. that works with Amex, it gives us tremendous power. I'd much rather work with, with, uh, with Ken and the Amex team, I'm focused on the market then, you know, some of the other carriers that have decided to go to J.P. Morgan Chase and they're all trying to fight for, fight for equal time with, with each other. We're, we're very, very happy with our Amex relationship. And I lied, you prompted something else, millennials. You know, just talk a little bit about this market. It's a key one. Yeah. Um, you have a millennial in your family and we've talked about this in the past. How does an airline Go out and attract that millennial customer. How do you think forward to five, ten years when that millennial is going to be hopefully buying premium cabin tickets? Yeah. Well, some, uh, you know, many of them already are uh, buying because because the average age of a consultant or a banker is about 31 years of age uh, of, of our travelers. So that's, uh, they're they're squarely in the millennial age, and so we already are relevant to that uh, to that population but as i i've shared with others in the past i do own three millennials and i haven't figured them out yet but uh <laughs> so look, be it for me to uh tell you how we're going to run our business based on a millennial demographic but there it, it's it's a different generation it's a generation that, that that values authenticity it values transparency obviously with technology being its native uh, language growing up around it changes the game. It's one of the reasons why we're so, and I'm personally so focused on getting our Wi-Fi on board our aircraft working the same speed in the air as on the ground, and we will have it on all of our mainline airplanes by the end of this year with the new 2KU technology, and then mm -hmm. we've got to figure out price points to make it the same price point on the ground as it is in the sky. So a lot of work to do. I, I, I tell GoGo all the time, I call them no-go. And until they earn the right to be GoGo, I'm, I'm still calling them no-go. But they're, they're working their way there. They're doing a good job. We've got, um, you know, we've got not just for our customers, we've got for our employees. By the end of this, uh, this decade, 
we estimate upwards of 40 to 50 percent of our employees are going to be of the millennial or younger generation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this, this generation is, is different, has different buying patterns, it wants to stay connected. It's why our digital strategy and technology is so important to us. It's why we're investing heavily. We're going to invest a half a billion dollars in technology this year, very much focused on, on, that, on that generation. Fantastic. I think we're going to now open it up to questions. I'll hand it back to Scott. Hi, uh, Jamie Baker with uh, JP Morgan. So the, the way that I see the industry's profit renaissance here in the States it's as if the industry has simply managed, I shouldn't say simply, has managed to cut itself an ample size piece of an aviation pie. And I would certainly argue that the size of that piece, the increase from the crumbs that at one time were left over for common shareholders, has come at the expense, the disintermediation of brick and mortar travel agencies, it's come at the expense of some of your captive regionals, uh, it's, you know, come at the expense potentially of the OEMs. Is the aviation pie or Delta's slice of that pie as large as it can currently get? Or if we're here a year from now, where do you think you will have made further progress? The investment banks, of course, Amex and, you know, speaking for my own employer, we have seen significant value return to the airline. Where does that size of the pie go from here? Uh, that's a great question, Jamie. We are uh, a very different business than ever in, in, in our history, and I am a proponent that, that things really have changed, and I know every time you say that, you know, people find 10 reasons why it hasn't, but it truly, truly has changed. I think the thing that's going to change about us for the future at Delta is the larger international thing. You know, we've got to be seen not just as a, a strong domestic airline, I want us to be seen as a very strong global airline and a global brand. And that's the path to me for the future. And I think that's going to inform our investments. That's why we're putting people in, whether it's Aeromexico or in Japan or in Brazil or in London. Uh, we've got a tremendous amount of growth. And, and, and you know, the international space is always going to be bumpy. It's going to be a little more volatile than you, what you'll find in the U.S. But I think that's where the long-range uh, opportunities will sit. Uh, I think the other thing that we're doing in the business in the next five to seven years is I think we're still a big scale player. We still have some great scale opportunities. We talk about upgaging where we're bringing larger aircraft with the 321s that are replacing the MD-80s or the 739s that are doing the same or going to the C-Series and knocking out the regionals. That's going to continue. Uh, we, we easily have five to seven years of additional rapid growth. It's going to allow us to take make better use of the air traffic infrastructure. Uh, it's going to put a little more pressure on the airports themselves, but that, that's what the, but, but it's, you know, you don't need any more gates or a landing uh, space or slots in order to accommodate that. And the new, the new engine technology and the new aircraft technology is, is, is really exciting. So we, uh, we're, we're investing heavily at the moment on the, on the aircraft side into that domestic space. And I think that's, I think that's another space where you can see it. See, so I, I, think the, our, I think our pie does get bigger, uh, and I think those are two areas you're going to see it, see it grow. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Jones with Pratt & Whitney. Yes. Uh, very glad to hear about the Wi-Fi improvements coming soon. Um, and I do have Me a, too. <laughs> I do have a, a related question. We saw British <laughs> Airways had a rough weekend with their computer failure. Delta had its own difficulties earlier this year. Is that a function of aging infrastructure, of overload, or, and what, what can you do about it? What can the well, industry do? I, I, have no, I have no idea what caused the, uh, the BA. Other, I read the same, the same that you read. They said they had some type of electrical, electrical problem. Uh, for hours, it was an electrical problem also. It was, it was bizarre. It read almost very similar to what we experienced. And it was, it was aging equipment. Uh, we had, a, uh, we had a, 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 a switch gear in, in, our, in our data center that, that, uh, that, that caught on fire from, from it's just, it was 40 years old. And it just, it burned and it charred and it, it caused the one side of our data center to shut. And then the flip side of that never, it turned on but not all the pieces of the, of the B side flipped on, and when the A side went to look for the B side, the whole, the whole complex came down. Um, we learned a, a really important lesson there. And uh, I think one of the things we've talked about is how this industry has, has invested and changed and made a lot of progress. Well, it's been in that uh, customer experience, it's been in the aircraft, it's been in the airports, 
we can't forget our back office, and we can't forget the, the cost of operating a, a, a quality business. So we're investing part of the, the half a billion dollars, Scott, that I mentioned on, on technology. We're putting $200 million of that into a new data center, which will be up and running this summer in North Atlanta that will eliminate that issue um, for the future. So we'll have an active, an active full redundant uh, capacity. But it's, you know, technology is, technology is the lifeblood. When I talk about technology with our people at Delta, we're, we're very proud of our people and our culture is what I think really separates our, our service level. You know, the airlines have storied legacies and histories and many people in this room are, are a huge part of that history. But, you know, the things that are, make airlines unique truly are only the people. It's the only thing that separates one airline from another airline. And our culture and our people, I think, are second to none. But second to that, technology, I think, is the second thing that will differentiate an airline and your ability to, to implement and drive technology and innovation. Uh, but you have to have a, a resilient backbone before you can, you can make that happen. So those are the two places that we're going to be investing heavily is, is people and technology. That's great, Ed. Thank you very, very much for coming Thanks, this afternoon. Sir.